Greetings, friends. My name is Weston Nakamura from Blockworks Macro in Tokyo. It's Tuesday, June 27, 2023, after Asia markets close. Welcome to the Market Depth Podcast, bringing you global market commentary and analysis from the Asia-Pacific trading session so that you know what happened overnight. Apologies for my absence and my voice. I've been battling a particularly uh, vicious bout of coronavirus. Um, and generally speaking, I'm, I'm one who, like, I never get sick, nor have ever actually suffered too badly when previously uh have been stricken by covid but this this one's particularly bad and so i'm not back to 100 percent, though no longer getting worse anymore but either way apologies just keep this in mind throughout this episode as neither my voice nor my brain is going to be functioning at capacity so three things for today first i just want to make a quick comment on the market reaction or lack thereof to the events out of rush over the weekend Second thing, what's currently the most important market price level anywhere at the moment? That would be dollar, yen, USD, JPY, now within 1% of where the Japan Ministry of Finance had previously conducted unilateral FX intervention last September and October of 2022. And then number three, what is the most significant macro event on the calendar for this week? Maybe even for for the month for that matter. The ECB is hosting their annual gathering of central bankers in Sintra, Portugal, where not only will we get a live panel stage of the very top brass from the most important major central banks, that being Chair Powell from the U.S. Fed, President Lagarde from the ECB, Governor Bailey from the Bank of England, but we also have a Governor Ueda from the Bank of Japan who will be gracing the same stage and will be speaking English for the first time in public since becoming the governor of the Bank of Japan. And so, while each of these four have increasingly diverging policy paths and agendas, respectively, for which those differences will be, you know, even more evident when placed side by side on stage with one another, the clear standout with policy is and has been always obviously bank of japan who is still easing into inflation and we have a whole new and by new i literally mean never before seen or heard from in this capacity until now new governor and face and spokesperson representing the bank of japan to try and explain to its other three peers, or rather to explain to the world with its other three peers sitting there in contrast, its ac- its actions with the Bank of Japan, okay? And so these three points for today, the yen hitting close to new breakout levels of weakness, the Sintra conference of last week, all of, the, of this week are all very much interrelated, <clears throat> okay? So first, regarding point number one, um, the drama that went on um, or may very well still be going on in Russia over the weekend. So there wasn't any market response, per se, by the time Asia markets open. This is from yesterday. This is from Monday. Um, Asia market close on uh, the 26th. And, uh, you know, I mean, you could see, like, besides the CSI 300, really, though, there the re- really wasn't too much in terms of market response. And really, there shouldn't have been. Not because what had unfolded within Russia isn't significant or anything. Obviously, it is. But because ultimately, before Asia markets open on, fr- on Monday, the developments in Russia took a very sharp reversal back to where they were, more or less. As in, like, yes, yes, you can make the case for the ir- you know, irreparable damage done to Mr. Putin's image and whatnot, but, I mean, like, this coup or this mutiny or whatever, the, whatever you want to call it, that was like a wire cut at the last moment and it didn't actually end up happening. So, therefore, Monday Asia market open, what new world was there for markets to have to price in relative to what could have been, you know, it could have been pricing in, right? So there's no market reaction that's like expected. However, no market reaction does not mean nothing to see here by any means. Markets that are quiet following some major geopolitical occurrence, that is information in itself, okay? It's not just that markets were more or less flat, as in like prices unchanged, but also on like low trading volumes. Okay, so if you take a look at this, this is just Japan um, over the trading session yesterday, Monday. 
And just look at the Japan cash equity trading volumes by notional turnover amount for the day relative to the previous five days. So the percent change in and of itself on the index isn't very meaningful without the context of trading volume and activity. And so here we have basically a market that is flat in terms of price percentage change and inactive. In other words, this is a market reaction of speechlessness, you know, more so than one of like ignoring what's going on in Russia. Now, with that said, there may be some developments out of Russia that may be playing at least some market impact of note. Um, and that is that it, the, the Russia kind of geopolitical risk off tone, it may have actually contributed to the slowing down of or the capping of the otherwise runaway dollar yen upside that was happening previous to that, prior to that, right? Albeit temporarily, but, but dollar yen upside being temporarily capped versus a runaway one directional move mid-momentum going right into Bank of Japan Governor Ueda's first English public you know, public speaking event. Those are two vastly different scenarios and setups, okay? And so Bank of Japan Governor gets to, you know, has the quote-unquote luxury of not having a runaway dollar yen um, going into this event, all right? Um, so this pause, even if it was just the slightest bit of like classic risk-off, you know, JPY haven bidding, that's significant, and it's significant for the most significant market and price out there in global macro at this current juncture, okay? And as I said, that would be dollar yen at 143 half. <clears throat> and I, for those uh, who are unaware or need a refresher, I will remind you why this is currently the most important market and price level out there as we speak. Currently, dollar yen is less than 1% away from the level in which the Japan Ministry of Finance had decided to conduct one of two unilateral, unilateral direct interventions into the international currency markets for the first time in two decades. Okay, The first of which was in September of 2022, and then the second of which they did in October of 2022. Okay, Prior to that, they haven't done so in decades. Now, I've actually covered this extensively at the time when it happened, before it happened, while it happened, in between those two, and then after it happened, right? Um, and so I will leave in the description to this episode a link to a Twitter thread that I wrote as a sort of comprehensive JPY price action explainer that I put out from January of this year for anyone who wants to, you know, who wants to basically just like lay it out in, in depth, comprehensively with charts, details, all that. So I suggest that you take a look at that if you want more info. Um, you know, it just goes through a, a lot of stuff. These are like charts from then. But here's what I'll say is the significance of these interventions. And I'm going to leave aside the G5 protocol breaking precedents that Japan had either irresponsibly took it upon itself to feel that the rules don't apply to them or the more likely scenario in which that this was on the surface unilateral, but really it was in the blessing of, if not the outright backroom coordination and explicit permission of the G5 counterparties of Japan, namely the U.S. Department of Treasury. If any time there was ever a time to call somebody like currency manipulator, it would be Japan at those moments. It did not happen. <clears throat> and furthermore, when Japan did that uh, last year in uh, September and October, the remarks that came out of Janet Yellen, who happened to be visiting Tokyo shortly after this happened, as well as the G20 gathering in D.C. shortly after that, it was just silence. Loud, blaring, deafening, complicit silence. Okay? So, that's the whole other part of the significance of uh, Japan unilateral intervention, quote-unquote unilateral, but from purely a market's perspective... That second one, that second intervention in October, okay, um, this was round two of two, okay? This occurred on Friday, October 21st at around 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, or shortly after midnight in Japan, when dollar yen had just broke out into fresh 30-year highs, and then right at 151.98, just before it was about to hit 152, again, shortly after midnight Japan time, and 
that was once again unilaterally smacked down by the Ministry of Finance intervening into uh, directly into foreign exchange markets. That's dollar yen going from one fifty one ninety eight. Let's call it one fifty two. Dollar yen one fifty two down to one forty eight, or like a three percent move on a major global FX pair in about an hour and a half, maybe less. Okay, that's massive. Now, uh, at this mo- at this time, you know when this was actually happening, uh, I was actually <laughs> I was um, I happened to be speaking on an FX trading seminar as a panelist. And uh, as as this was going on, like I was on a live panel discussion at the time. Um, and then a few hours later, I actually happened to catch a flight from Tokyo to the U.S. at USD JPY 150 plus at, at 30 year highs. Right. So there, there you go for my my uh, trading timing, if you will. But uh, if you're not trading dollar yen or exposed to the yen, you know, who gives a flying F about this? Right. Well. Look, so look, I'm just going to well, I'm just going to skip. Like some of these, um, you could read that thread that I mentioned, but okay, here, here's why. Why was this second intervention in particular a major market uh, event, if not the most significant single one off global macro market event in all of 2022? And yes, that is quite the statement to make, but, but I'm not being hyperbolic. The reason is because. When the Japan Ministry of Finance directly and unilaterally intervened into the foreign exchange markets to blast dollar yen downwards, that was not only top tick in USD JPY till this very day, but it also marked top tick in 10 year US Treasury yields at that exact same moment at a high of 4.335%, a level that had not been seen since 2008 okay let me just repeat that okay we're talking about the 10-year u.s treasury yield otherwise known as the global benchmark risk-free rate for which basically every other financial instrument is priced off of in one way or another that was top tick for that rate in other words the most important price in global markets from january of 2022 at 1.5% on the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. In the next nine months, it had been rapidly approaching 4.5% in just those nine months alone, okay? And that basically is about, what, like a minus 20% mark-to-market loss on the year of the bond price itself year-to-date on what's supposed to be the most risk-free safe haven instrument of all others out there. You know, the asset that has the most inherent structural demand for it. But it could not stop selling off or having its yield surge. A market in freefall that could not find stabilization for the life of it until it did. And what was the godlike force that finally did what nothing else could do until then? It was Japan officials unilaterally intervening in the FX markets to sell dollar by yen swiftly, sharply, and, you know, would be almost illegally, again, if not for the actual backroom consent of the other parties. Now, look, I'm not saying that Japan Ministry of Finance FX intervention had the, you know, the, the main purpose or aim of putting in a hard pivot on the, the U.S. Treasury market sell-off as its, like, main prerogative or, or any goal at all, right? But it's also not exactly an unwelcome side effect um, for... The U.S. yield surge to get smacked back downwards towards JGB's stuck at 25 basis point ceiling, like that helps Japan, all right? Um, it, again, it wasn't the you know intended purpose. The intended purpose was directly just to you know cap the FX rate, but um, or to put a floor on, on on the yen. But this is a side effect that is very welcome to Japan as well, right? And it's not just helping Japan. This also helps the United States from having to issue debt at ever higher borrowing costs or what would have you know perhaps even been an even sooner or greater size silicon valley bank mark to market losses on bond portfolios or all of that right so that's why this is welcomed you know like protocol breaking as it is it's welcomed by both sides um, of uh, the pacific or atlantic or the world for that matter um, <clears throat> and again i'm just going to flash through these 
slides. So if you get lost, uh, you know, because I'm going too fast, and if you want more in depth detail, just look at the aforementioned Twitter thread um, on my Yen Explainer. But basically, the reason the world's biggest market pivot of 2022, okay, in October, when the risk free rate suddenly reversed its precipitous one-way directional surge that had occurred. What this intervention did in the FX markets was that it triggered a record-sized yen futures short covering on record-crowded short yen futures positioning that had, been, that had existed year-to-date. Notice that volume um, circle. That is nearly 600,000 contracts of yen futures on CME Okay, that had traded. That's about $50 billion notional. And apologies, uh, it wasn't uh, on the, the most on single-day record. It was just shy of single-day record. Um, this is your single-day record. This is November of 2016. This is Trump versus Hillary Clinton shock election win day when there was true global cross-asset market mayhem. That was the only other time where more notional volume in, volume in yen futures had traded, and not by much more either, right? And by the way, yen futures on CME are massive, massive size futures contracts. Each futures contract is 12.5 million yen notional per one contract. But yeah, it was about 50 billion notional in yen futures that traded on October 22nd, 2022, and more than half of which traded within a two-hour time frame, okay? There was no similar unusually large U.S. Treasury futures volume or activity at that whipsaw moment. This was JPY driven, okay, due to non-economic state actor interventions and pulling correlated futures assets along with the ride. And by no means was this, you know, a sudden turn in, in U.S. Treasuries, despite 99% of rates commentators who once again still believe that October bottom in Treasuries was due to insert whatever nonsense that isn't directly market-specific or market-tied reason, for which there was only one thing that happened, Japan officials meddling in international markets. This was the ultimate short squeeze trigger and the start of a more orderly and drawn-out short covering process that subsequently sort of took place thereafter, okay? Um, that's This is just U.S. Treasury futures. As you can see, they're very much aligned, and that's where they bought them. <clears throat> Same chart zoomed in. Here is positioning. Um, I'll skip this over. Um, it's also in the thread as well. But with regards to positioning, right, basically this is like the very crowded positioning um, into net, you know, short yen futures that had been building up. But it wasn't it wasn't just from the leveraged hedge fund community. What really moved the shorts was the asset manager community who had a much bigger net short position and much more fundamentally based short covering process uh, that took place over, you know, unwound over the next several weeks as things like US CPI slowdown um, beginning and various other data points. Uh, coming in one by one that showed the, you know, U.S. to Japan policy divergence trade was kind of nearing its end and, um, you know, that that basically taking place. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> here's where we stand now. Your yen futures and 10-year U.S. Treasury futures. Um, we have once again a pile back into yen short positioning, but not nearly as one-sided as it was last year. Um, and yen shorts are now, uh, rightfully so, afraid of um, or on high alert of the Ministry of Finance doing this again at these levels. Um, and so these are the levels that we need to be very cognizant of. Now, here's the thing. This time, if there's a vicious yen short cover that triggers a UST futures short cover, you know, that UST bid or the UST yield collapse, um, that can potentially be far more impacted than in October when the market got turned around. So you might have heard about this, you know, lately about this like hedge funds being record short 10-year U.S. Treasury futures, like the most on record, right? 
it's not necessarily due to this, right? Um, because I suspect, and many others do as well, that while, yeah, indeed, much of this positioning, this short positioning by levered funds, um, much of this indeed can be just outright short treasuries for a directional bet. Much of this, if not most of this, is also likely a basis trade. It's part of a basis trade, okay? And a basis trade is basically when your long cash treasuries and your short treasury futures. And so you're actually directionally neutral. Uh, in addition to that, I'll also add this. This is the asset manager's net positioning. These are not not the levered funds uh, positioning. And you'll see that with asset managers, they're actually record long, these same instruments, 10-year U.S. Treasury futures. Okay, so levered funds and asset managers, they actually more or less like kind of offset each other in terms of positioning. As opposed to the previous yen short positioning charts I showed earlier, where both levered funds and asset managers were one way crowded directionally short yen, and which was therefore ripe for a squeeze, which had then occurred. Nonetheless, <clears throat> another Japan unilateral intervention can come at any point, and if and when it does, it may be temporary, it may be relatively isolated without too much spillover, but, but it can also trigger cross asset force position exiting and what's the yen most correlated with u.s treasuries risk-free rate okay so be on high alert as we have now returned to levels in which the japanese government who by the way has plenty of firepower to do this for now um although obviously not forever but the japanese government may just reset the global risk-free rate upon us at any moment. And I really do mean at any moment. Here's the latest out of the Ministry of Finance job owning. This is uh, from, actually this is from yesterday, from Monday. But this is exactly word for word, you know, language that they used leading up to the previous interventions. Okay, when they're talking about we will respond appropriately, we are concerned about volatility, rapid, one-sided, excessive moves, so on and so forth. Um, not you know, currencies need to be moving on fundamentals, which is the stupidest argument because yield spreads are fundamentals of how currencies move, moron. Um, but nonetheless, this is what's coming out. Okay, these are kind of precursors to when there have been previous interventions in the past few months. The biggest and most obvious potential moment of getting a runaway dollar yen upside this week, which can then be subsequently smacked down the other direction, is going to be this Wednesday. As the four most powerful people on the planet, you know, convene on stage in Sintra, Portugal. Okay, so here's the schedule. Uh, I assume this is all local time. It's for tomorrow, Wednesday. Um, this is the closing panel of the ECB Forum on Central Banking. This is, by the way, this is going on um, all week, or it's going on currently as we speak. But just take a look at the names on that roster, okay? And then think about what each of them just did or said at their respective policy meetings. That is what policy divergence looks like sitting right before your eyes for this panel, okay? That's going to be very interesting now also if you look at these names you'll likely be familiar with three of these individuals these three and by be familiar with i simply mean you have likely heard them speak english and you know what their voices may sound like right that's what i mean very simple you know what hell let's even throw in sarah eisen from cnbc the moderator because that's the level of basic familiar basic familiarity that I'm referring to. Like literally like you've heard them speak English before. Well, how about this guy? Anyone ever hear Kazuo Ueda in the role of the governor of the Bank of Japan speak a single word of English? I don't mean with policy. I mean a single word of English, period, since becoming a governor. No, we haven't. None of us have. Okay, so that will be interesting. But 
let's for the moment just put that aside. Let's say assume he's like he's fine in that department of speaking English. Okay. Again, going back to the other three: Andrew Bailey, Christine Lagarde, Jerome Powell. We know more or less what they've been striving for, right? They've brought more or less just been you know trying to tighten up policy to combat inflation in their respective jurisdictions, and rightfully so. They are starting to splinter a bit in terms of policy, but the overall general direction for all three has been hawks. Inflation is surging in their respective regions and globally, and so they've removed the free money punch bowl, they're raising rates, they're ending QE, and so on. In Governor, Bailey, in Governor Bailey's case, he's even outright saying what his minion, Hugh Pill, had been saying. For the love of God, stop asking for higher wages, people. And look, I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. It's not in my place, so I'm not a UK citizen. I'm not, it's not my jurisdiction. I'm just saying that that's what they're saying. And honestly, that's what Powell and Lagarde are also thinking too, but can't say politically. Either way, clearly, they've been hawks, and appropriately so. Inflation is a serious problem. But Governor Ueda of the Bank of Japan, he comes from a different planet altogether. Because while the other three peers have been tightening policy to combat inflation, and by the way, it's not just these three, it's basically every other major central bank and region doing the exact same thing. But while that's been going on, for the Bank of Japan, under former Governor Kuroda, for which current rookie Governor Ueda has seemingly adopted policy from, they are, in their own repeated words and actions, still conducting massive monetary easing because they are trying to generate inflation. Literally the exact opposite of the three hawks. The relative hawks, the actual hawks, the three before them. Okay? Now, what level of inflation is their ultimate goal for the Bank of Japan? Um, what's the target of inflation for which all this easing is taking place? 2% CPI. What's Japan's CPI currently? Mid 3%. Now, former Governor Kuroda, as I've always said, you got to hand it to him in the PR public presentation arena as someone who was able to sell this policy or spin this, right? Maybe not well, maybe well, it's, it's up to you to decide. But who really can? Native English speakers included, right? But we don't have a Governor Kuroda anymore. Who do we have? I have no idea who we have, and none of us do, because this will be the first time you will hear a Bank of Japan Governor Ueda speak about Japan monetary policy from the role of sitting governor of the Bank of Japan. And look, it's not so much about whether or not the content of what he says is convincing to markets and how he will try to spin it um, you know, as you know, Japan inflation needs to not be cost push based and it needs to be sustained um, over periods of time and not be transitory. It also needs to be driven off the back of higher wage inflation. Um, and again, with Lagarde, Powell, and Bailey sitting right there, you know, in complete, uh, you know, uh, opposition, I guess. But all that aside, I'm not looking for that. What I'm looking for is where his actual level of international communication capabilities are. And the reason why that is what the bigger picture matter is, is because, recall, as I have been repeatedly saying, Governor Ueda was not supposed to be in this role as the governor of the Bank of Japan currently. Okay, He was a last-minute scramble pick by Prime Minister Kishida, who was totally blindsided by his shortlist of Kuroda successors, who one by one declined the job kind of last minute and 100% understandably so. And as I've been saying, anyone on the inside of the Bank of Japan or anyone in the know, right, of the state that the BOJ finds itself um, and will f be finding itself over the next five year, you know, tenure, anyone who is qualified enough to take that role does not want it. And the only ones who would take the role of the governor of Bank of Japan after an undoable Kurodonomics is someone who doesn't know that they don't know what they're getting into. Now, just a few months ago, when news reporters rushed to then-college professor Ueda's front door in his house on a rainy Friday evening, 
with cameras and microphones in his face asking about headlines that he was press leaked to be Prime Minister Kishida's nominee as the next BOJ governor. Um, and a Professor Ueda had a very bewildered look on his face standing in the front door. At that time, Kishida said that the reason he had chosen this individual, Kazuo Ueda, was particularly because of his international communication capabilities, his like superior international communication capabilities um, uh, regarding policy, which to me at the time and still remains completely bullshit because of so many reasons, um, some of the most obvious being, first of all, the way that he conveyed that you know, had implied as if Kuroda didn't already have international presence and communication capabilities, which he certainly did. Kuroda's a fluent English speaker and policy communicator. Second reason, is that really the most critical characteristic on the resume for the governor of the Bank of Japan in this era? One who could speak English? Okay, and then thirdly, if he's so internationally recognized as this is worldly community worldly communicator right the the ronald reagan of central bankers if you will then why in the hell is are there z virtually zero records of or, or footage of ueda speaking english anyone ever heard him speak english i don't care if he has an accent i assume he does i don't care i care that that standout characteristic is absent from public domain because it means that it's not really the reason that you picked the guy, Prime Minister Kishida. And by the way, as for just communication of policy in general, so Kazuo Ueda was, until recently, before he became Bank of Japan governor, he was, earlier this year, he was a college professor of economics in Tokyo. And with all due respect, not exactly a top college at that. Not that I went to a top college, graduated in the bottom 10th percent of my class. Then again, nobody's tapping me to be the Bank of Japan governor, right? But regardless, if you look up what Ueda Sensei's review was given by his students were, they're basically saying that this professor is not very good at communicating points clearly. And what is he teaching? Economics. So that is complete flies completely in the face of these these you know characteristics these outstanding characteristics that oh, that made him the obvious choice to become bank of japan governor according to kashida it's the most important thing about Sintra this week it's not andrew bailey saying stop asking for raises or is it you know, powell saying i don't know about july fomc but i do know about years of policy path from here no cuts nor is it Christine Lagarde being very hawkish thanks to Bank Japan's QE anchoring policy, as I've discussed in a recent episode of Market Depth. The most important takeaway I'll be looking for is, is Governor Ueda actually a good or even halfway decent policy communicator on the international stage? And if he's not, I don't really care. I can understand him in Japanese. But what I do therefore care about is that indeed it would mean that Prime Minister Kishida did not actually make the most important nomination of his lifetime based on Ueda's communication abilities, as he claims. But rather, indeed, that was just a nonsense filler explanation, and the real explanation is highly likely that nobody wanted the job of the governor of the Bank of Japan after Kuroda because those who have the view from the inside can see what's coming or what exists and wants nothing to do with it. People like Amamiya, Deputy Governor, governor Amamiya, who's been there for 40 years, Bank of Japan lifer, out by his own accord. He was supposed to be the governor, right? He's out. And the others on the list, right? In which case, we're all very screwed when the yield curve control experiment ratchets up in intensity again. Now, I obviously hope that's not the case, that the current Bank of Japan governor is not some, just, the, some guy who just stumbled into the job, in this very critical job. Uh, I obviously hope that's not the case, but I need to know if that is the case either way. We all do. Okay, So to tie it all back in together, when you have USD via Chair Powell, the euro via President Lagarde and the British pound via Governor Bailey all 
surging on their respective and relative hawkish rhetoric out of Sintra coming. And then you have sitting right next to them a uh, Bank of Japan Governor Ueda masterfully or otherwise discussing more easing necessary to achieve inflation in Japan. Watch for the yen to get crushed. And then, as it does, watch for the yen to get smacked higher by the Ministry of Finance, maybe even during the actual event itself, and potentially putting a simultaneous cap in DM yields at the same time. That is, of course, unless Russia caps dollar yen for Japan again temporarily. Oh, sorry. Also, one more thing. Earlier panel um, for the ECB Center event for tomorrow. We actually have ECB's Luis Guindos. He's the vice president of ECB. This is the guy who actually published that ECB financial stability report calling out BOJ normalization as a major risk <laughs> to financial stability that I talked about in a recent episode of Market Depth. He is hosting a panel on monetary policy normalization, in which I assume he will once again call out BOJ on normalization risk. Um, okay, and so just to end, finally, uh, here are some charts. First, this is the German to Italian yield spread, or what the ECB yield spread control is there to contain. And as you can see, the Italy BTP to German Bund yield spread basically acts, it, it kind of behaves like, you know, junk bond spreads, um, but for like the Eurozone sovereigns. And so those sovereign credit spreads expand and contract in line with like risk on and risk off. Um, and you can see that as I overlay uh, SPX e minis on top. That's why that spread matters to all of us. Okay. Uh, this is over the longer term as well. And then here is to your U.S. Treasury yields and dollar yen that are lockstep as of late. Okay. So from the front end of the U.S. Treasury curve um, and dollar yen reflecting both the U.S. monetary policy as well as Japan monetary policy on hold. Here is a chart of the yen carry trade, okay, as expressed by AUDJPY Aussie yen versus risk assets or SPX e minis that are um, that have really started to correlate, uh, say beginning of April uh, till till recent, as more and more people uh, start to drop the notion of Bank of Japan is going to change policy, and so therefore. JGB rate volatility went down and therefore made it, uh, you know, a, a more attractive carry trade uh, funding leg of the carry trade, the short leg of the carry trade. So that's at risk of unwinding as well or experiencing volatility. Then finally, here's a Nikkei index versus dollar yen itself. And as I said before, currently in a very unusual and rare situation in which the equity market may be contributing to driving FX. Okay, not the other way around. Very rare phenomenon, um, if indeed this is the case, um, even if it is happening just in part, meaning that a pullback or an outright sell-off in Nikkei can not only trigger a broader downside move in global DM indices, but then can pull dollar yen down, which can there, therefore pull U.S. Treasury yields down and then into a feedback loop onto itself on a cross-asset global market basis stemming from just a simple sell-off in very, very elevated Japan equity markets. And then speaking of Japan equity markets, later on this week in Japan, we have the busiest days of Japan's corporate AGM season, AGM, Annual General Shareholders Meetings. This is These these are th where things like buybacks, dividends, corporate governance changes, and all that, you know, discussions and stuff like that take place, presentations, um, all of that st takes place or doesn't take place, okay? Um, and considering that this is one of the primary reasons for the long Japan by foreign inflows taking place, right, that corporate uh, governance in Japan is changing to bec become more shareholder-friendly and all that, these AGMs could actually become a potential broad DM equity catalyst, but to the downside, because improving corporate governance in Japan is already priced in, more so than not at the moment, right? So when these AGMs come around one by one, it can 
be more so a, you know, okay, well, nothing new here, all in line with what we thought. This is why we went long. Okay, good job. And it could result in even profit taking. Um, and that kind of market reaction of a sell the news, buy the rumor, sell the news type of thing could happen more so than a surprise upside buy more driver. Okay, so in conclusion, FX traders, rates traders, DM equity, and NASDAQ traders, eyes on Sintra tomorrow. On behalf of Blogworks Macro, my name is Wes Nakamura. I'm going to go pass out. Please read my Twitter thread on the yen. I will see you all tomorrow with my takeaways on Sintra and any market action that may come uh, afterwards. Keep an eye on Dollar Yen as well, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.